Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, the simplest cloud platform out there. And we're excited to share they now offer dedicated virtual droplets. And unlike standard droplets, which use shared virtual CPU threads, their two performance plans, general purpose and CPU optimized, they have dedicated virtual CPU threads. This translates to higher performance and increased consistency during CPU intensive processes. So if you have build boxes, CI, CD, video encoding, machine learning, ad serving, game servers, databases, batch processing, data mining, application servers, or active front end web servers that need to be full duty CPU all day, every day, then check out DigitalOcean's dedicated virtual CPU droplets. Pricing is very competitive, starting at 40 bucks a month. Learn more, get started for free with a $50 credit at do.co slash changelog. Again, do.co slash changelog. From Changelog Media, you're listening to the Changelog, a podcast featuring the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators of software development. I'm Adam Stachowiak, Editor-in-Chief here at Changelog. On today's show, we're joined by CJ Silverio, aka SiegeBot on Twitter, aka Second Hire and former CTO of NPM Inc. We're talking with Siege about her recent JSConf EU talk titled The Economies of Open Source, where she laid out her concerns with the JavaScript language commons being owned by venture capitalists. Currently, the JavaScript language commons is controlled by the NPM registry. And as you may know, NPM is a VC-backed for-profit startup. Of course, we also talked with Siege about the bomb she dropped in Tropic at the end of that talk, a federated package registry for JavaScript that she kind of hopes will unseat NPM and free the JavaScript comments. So we are super excited to be joined by CJ Silverio. You may know her as SiegeBot or simply Siege. Hello. Second hire and former CTO at NPM. And you're here to talk about something new and shiny and, and not even out there yet. Don't use it yet, but it's super exciting. It's in Tropic. Uh, Siege, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with y'all. It's a pleasure to be talking JavaScript, too. Absolutely. So you kind of dropped a bomb at JSConf EU and have uh, one of the most watched videos from the conference talks, which was published on June 3rd all about the economies of open source. We're going to dive mm. all into that, but mm -hmm. can you give the elevator pitch or the brief synopsis? Everybody will link up that. You should de definitely go watch it, especially like the last five or six minutes where the bomb gets dropped. But <laughs> Siege, if you could, I just yeah. loved it. It was like, I wish I was in the room because everyone was so excited. You were excited. That was an amazing moment. I have never had a conference speaking moment like that before. Them, I, I, when I literally when I got up, I had no idea how the crowd would react to the news. And okay. when I heard, heard the reaction, it was I was as surprised as anybody else. In this talk, I talk about I talk about npm. I talk about JavaScript's package manager. I talk about its history, including a, a bunch of history that most people involved in JavaScript now might not know because it's you know it started in two thousand and nine, and bulk of people using JavaScript on a daily basis never needed to know where it came from. It was just a fact of life. Right. You start using JavaScript today, you're using NPM. Well, how did NPM get there? Why is NPM there? Okay, it's a company. Why is it a company? How does it make money? What are its goals and motivations? And because I was an insider in part of the story, I could talk about that part of the story. Mm -hmm. It turns out that when you run something at that scale, it does cost money to run. And it, it's probably not a consequential number when you talk about giant businesses, right? Like it's, I think Lori Voss, the chief operating officer at the time, figured that you could run NPM, the company, for 99 years for the amount of money Uber burned in a single quarter. Oh, wow. Which is wow. like, like, so scale, right? That tells scale. you it's, it's, it's actually pretty small on the the cost scale, but it's still a notable amount of money as far as human beings are concerned. You know, the, when you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars a month, well, you know, $30,000 and up in, in AWS bills and network bills, like that's notable, right? You have to have a story yeah. for how you're going to pay to run a package registry that every single JavaScript developer uses for free, right? right. Free is relative. You type npm install react 
or create React app. You didn't pay anything for that, but it still cost money to happen. So how does that work? Right. Yeah. Oh, we don't have to think about that. We just it just works. It just does. <laughs> yeah. Magic for, money comes for a little while. For a little the while. The fairies and bills get paid. Yeah. The the you you leave out a little dish of milk and then the the JavaScript <laughs> <laughs> once a year. Yeah. Cookies you know. Once so a year. this is this is JS milk right here. <laughs> it, you know, it, we I worked on the technical side of that, right? So you know, we often came up. You know, people who worked at NPM would talk about how that happens. So, you know, everyone understands that, yeah, there's technical work that has to happen in order to bring that JavaScript to you. But then I felt it was time for people to look at where the money was coming from, why the money had to be there, and what the consequences of that are. Mm -hmm. Because we as a group, as a community of JavaScript developers, took all of our comments, all of these open source packages that we want to share with each other, and we handed them over to a company that's VC funded. And, you know, obviously I was totally okay with this, this at the time. I like, mm-hmm. I knew, I knew, okay, VC money comes with a hook, but I thought we'd be okay. Uh. I think the talk in Entropic, the project come from my realization that I was fundamentally wrong. I made a mistake, not in like really working hard to make node succeed to make javascript go like that was fantastic work that i am so proud of and i'm yeah, so you don't proud. regret that time do you no no i don't regret that time i worked with a fantastic team that i have been blessed in my career i have worked with some amazing companies i've worked with famous people and people on their way toward fame and brilliant people who i've learned from npm team was just fantastic people they were great human beings to work with and i'm extremely proud of them and of the work we did together. But I think it was in the service of the wrong cause. Mm. Not JavaScript, but the underlying profit motive was the wrong thing for that particular task. Mm-hmm. Mm. What was that profit motivation? I go I go a lot into this in the talk, but the motivation, it, it turns out like when you take VC money, you are suddenly in it in order to give the VCs a payoff. This is like a completely open transaction. Like when you take money from VCs, you should know this is generally how they approach it. This is how their funds work. Absolutely. This is what their timeline is for getting a return on investment. And you can't like opt out of that. Once you've handed over a chunk of your company to them in exchange for this money, they in fact want that payoff. And you have handed control over your company to them in exchange for that payoff. Sometimes that's exactly the right trade-off to make. I'm working for a company right now that like VC funding makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, external funding makes perfect sense because the money has a, has a very clear thing you can do with it. It has a very clear way to accelerate the business. And there's a very clear exit story that makes sense, aligns with VC goals. And for something like a language ecosystem, this is not a short-term project. This is not a um, go big or go home project, right? It's not a, uh, we're going to grow, we're going to be the biggest possible, we're going to make a lot of money, we're going to have an exit, or we're just going to go bust, and we're going to be on that Tumblr blog of like my incredible journey, where you shut down right. everything, right? You can't do Start that. Start graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that with, with the thing that all of JavaScript needs to keep running. So, I mean, there was a, t- there's a moment in time and again, the, the talk goes through that and you do a very good job of going mm-hmm. kind of step by step through the history. There were some there that I, I definitely learned. Even Adam and I have been, you know, along for the ride, so to speak, mm-hmm. both as users of NPM and as mm-hmm. people who are having these conversations. We've had Isaac on Founders Talk. We've had mm-hmm. NPM employees, current and past on a lot of our shows. So, we're, yeah. so we've been along for the ride, but definitely worth getting, getting the full history. And there was a po- point in time where it's like, this thing can exist for free without somebody stepping up and, and putting money in. And so like at that point, it was like, well, there's different ways of, of doing that. And the way that it went was VC capital. And that really brought NPM for into the, you know, for years, it sustained it for years, but it brought all of us alongside it and centralized the, the commons. That was the moment I got involved actually. And I probably wouldn't have been involved without like, like some way to pay my salary or at least that amount of cons- all-consuming work for f- I, is something people don't do for free. You should yeah. never expect them to do for free. Like sure. that's the way to burn people out. Like NPM at the time it was founded, it was just at the the very end of 2013 was when like those first 
discussions happened. At the very beginning of 2014 is when the company started moving as a company. During that period, NPM was just a it was a tire fire. It was down. It was like nine sixes of availability. Uh, it's yeah. it was um, it needed serious attention and serious operational work to to stabilize it. And that is not something. It's hard to get that from human beings. It's hard to have people on call twenty four seven without paying something for their time and attention. Mm-hmm. And the trade off the trade off is really interesting because. Most of the language systems haven't done this, right? The like CPAN has chosen a very different approach to this, but RubyGems is a volunteer run thing. And your expectations for RubyGems are very different from where your expectations for NPM are. The scale that NPM reached was possible because they had a team of professionals working on it and moving it from from a single like couch db to the system it was right to the system that it is now today yeah. mm-hmm. when you say the expectations for ruby gems is different do you mean in terms of support like speed of downloads because all, ruby gems right. is free to the end user just like npm is right it's all of these things npm support mm-hmm. was for a while uh, legendary the npm support team was just fantastic a bunch of really very empathetic customer centered people who did most of their time was spent supporting open source users, not paid users. Uh, and mm-hmm. The attempt was to give that really excellent, high quality level of support to everybody. You can't do that if you're not paying salaries because you're like using somebody on their free time, and you're like the service level agreements kind of like you know you never really sign up for that for with NPM, but people came to expect that mm-hmm. they would get a really nice, professional, supportive, helpful answer from a, a professional support team and the uptime again, you know, when mm-hmm. it's, when something is run by volunteers, you have a f- level of forgiveness that like they might not be awake at 3 AM in their time zone, but at PM, because it was a company and cause it could afford like to run operations 24 seven, we had a team of contractors in Eastern Europe helping us on the times that we were asleep because all that support was there. The expectation became that it would be up, that it would be fast, that you would get professional level support because it was a company it could do this. Mm-hmm. And this, I think, let it reach a scale and a ubiquity and an unthinking use level that it's, it's harder for languages that didn't do this mm. to reach. So we have a lot of listeners in the JavaScript and uh, NPM ecosystem. And I'll just say for many years, NPM was kind of a bastion of JavaScript and the ecosystem because of a lot of the support. I mean, the people that were there were all, are awesome. And it hasn't been until the last maybe six, eight months, maybe a year where we started to see the, what's the, the kinks in the chinks in the armor? I don't know. We started to see the, yeah. the problems uh, come yeah. about. But for those people who are maybe you know writing go day to day or not, not in that ecosystem, can you describe a few of the things where we say this is... Why is this a problem? What are we seeing where we're thinking maybe we made a bad decision? Or you said specifically you, you would have made a different decision back then maybe. Right. The idea that, that you might lose this thing or that this thing is in the, the hands of someone whose who's incentives are not aligned with yours. Node, mm-hmm. for example, uh, is part of the OpenJS Foundation. It was its own foundation for a while. This is a community resource. It's the, it's the platform definition, the implementation of the platform, the direction that it goes in. This is essentially a community project. It's funded by corporations, but not by any one corporation. And they all have their goals, right? And they sometimes are at odds with each other, but mostly the, the turtles, there's no one turtle that like, you know, wins. <laughs> They're just climbing over each other. I, that <laughs> that <laughs> metaphor is very insulting to them all. You're all are turtles. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe insulting to turtles. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. But the, the point is, is that like it, it, there are checks and balances, and in the mm-hmm. end, where the community needs to know to go is where it goes. And here we have this important, critical part of the, the ecosystem, our shared code base, the things we give away to each other to reuse, to build the web with, isn't part of that foundation. It is in the hands of a company that like needs to return its investment. Now, what are the things it's going to do to return that investment? Do you really want advertising in your NPM from your NPM client? This is something that VCs would occasionally very also proudly suggest to us. Yes, have you thought about putting advertising in the client? You know, and the answer is always, <laughs> lol. Yeah, right. 
Well, we've seen a few package maintainers starting to try such things like this, and there's lots of backlash. Developers mm -hmm. don't like it, and then there's a lot yeah. of conversation. Well, it's a free thing. You got to support the maintainer, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole... The whole thing there that will that will breeze over, but yeah, for VCs for sure, it's a straightforward path, right? For right. exactly, we're in this cycle of people needing to get paid salaries to do fine yeah. jobs, like needed to be done, yeah, with NPM to get to the skill it's at, yeah, and we've got to find some way to get the money. And the way that NPM thought to get the money to do this great adventure was through venture capital, and but that had some obvious downsides to it. But then there's also some obvious upsides to venture capital, which is large amounts of cash, right. hiring the right kind of people, you know, accomplishing mm -hmm. a mission. But yeah, but you know, you got that pay that payback process happening. That's right. Right. There's a new master, yeah. basically. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, and if you if you do your job as a company, if you come up with a product that pays the bills, right? If MPM had found a way to monetize the public registry, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It, I would, you know, everything would feel differently. But they never found a way to make their biggest expense turn into income. Mm, like right. it's. All of those brilliance of downloads, that nearly exponential download graph, represents cost. Right. We're able to with with like solid engineering work. I won't say brilliant engineering work. I think it was solid, straightforward engineering work of the kind you can feel good about. That like turned it mostly into linear costs in response to that exponential growth. But still, costs continue to rise. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was the goal of the new CEO, right? So we, we had Isaac yeah. on Founders Talk. Adam, you talked to him. This was a year yeah. ago, maybe more. And he was bringing on a new CEO. And it was his job to to find a way to turn those costs into yeah. profits, right? And that's been the, where the, we got really rocky after that. Yeah, it did. It, it's just, He was interesting. He's an interesting character. Is he still there? He's still the CEO today? He's still, surprisingly yes. to me, still the CEO, yeah. He questioned assumptions in a way that I actually think was useful and healthy. Like, you know, he walks in and says, why, why do we have to run the public registry? Now, that's a perfectly legit question to ask about the company. It's a kind of a earth-shaking question to ask if your vantage point is JavaScript. Right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Let's just turn this cost thing yeah. off. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think I don't think anybody like ever floated turn the cost thing off. It would be give right. the cost thing away, but it kind of rocks the foundation of the whole reason the company exists. Why does NPM the company exist to run the public registry? Why did everyone who went to work there work there? It was to run the public registry. Uh, that was a very mission driven group of people, right? And I, I was totally driven by the mission myself. Public registry was why I cared about my job. It was a way to have a really high impact on the world and on developers like when your work is used by every single web developer in the world oh, yeah. that's that's amazing it's just such a lucky thing to have in your career that feeling so let's let's return to the end of the talk now because we've talked about some of the problems with npm and i want to set the stage i want everybody to go watch especially the end because it's so much fun uh, i will yeah. admit as a as an interested listener but somebody not there and i was just watching it you know along for the ride step by step i started thinking I, I understand step-by-step step what she's saying. So far, it sounds like mostly just stating the problem. You know, I'm like, I'm not going to say you're overly complainy, but I, like I was starting to feel depressed. I'm like, yeah, this is like just problems, problems, problems. And then you said, I'm not a fan of hand-wringing. I don't like the do-nothing answer. And you said, I believe in open source. It's good for us to give code away to others. And you announced Entropic. Oh, like, yeah. That was, the, that was the bomb drop for me. And... <laughs> This was now, awesome. Tell everybody what Entropic yeah. is for those who weren't there or haven't watched it yet. Entropic is an open source federated package manager and CLI for JavaScript. It doesn't have to be for JavaScript. I have goals of solving package management problems for other languages someday, but JavaScript first. We set out to make something that made it would make it possible for everyone to run their own registry without needing to shoulder the full burden of being a centralized registry for all of the JavaScript ecosystem. You can mirror or support as much as traffic as, as, you need, as you need to. You mirror the part of the registry you're using. There might be a lot of these. They federate data with each other. I was deeply inspired, not by Mastodon's API, but Mastodon's the concept of activity pub and how you can have something that replaces the centralization of Twitter with something where I can run a Mastodon. I do run a Mastodon instance and my friends are on it 
and we participate in this wider ecosystem. And I don't have to be Twitter sized in order to do that. I thought, why don't why can't I do this with package management? The the other thing that we had, Chris, my partner in this project, Chris Dickinson and I, um, we are now joined by Kat Marchand, but Kat wasn't part of the project at the time of the announcement. Chris Dickinson and I had spent the previous four years, more or less, running NPM's registry, coping with the scaling challenges inherent in it. And we, we had a very good understanding of the set of problems you have to solve in order to do this at scale. We had a very clear idea of the problems with NPM's data model. Something quite like living with something and needing to make it go big to understand exactly why it was a bad idea. <laughs> you never know it at the, when you start it. And, you know, we knew what was wrong with the API. We knew what a good API would look like. We had some very clear ideas about how to make this, like, achievable for normal human beings who didn't have an enormous AWS account and bandwidth to burn. So we said, okay, let's do it. We were there for the mission. Let's keep working on the mission. Let's make it so that we, whoever does this next doesn't need VC level money to make it work. So that you can take control of your data. If say Substack, I, I love, I love talking about Substack cause he's like, he's such a fascinating human being. Have you ever had him on the show? He's James Halliday. Have we had him? Not yet. No, not yet. What's wrong with us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very active in early node, right? And he's got all these little, like he, he and Dominic Tarr have all these little modules that are like- We've had like, Dominic on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Dominic is another great example of like, I want to hand him back control of his stuff. I want it possible for Dominic to, to run his own entropic instance and just federate his stuff to the world and maybe even sell access to it if he wants to make money as an open source author. I think that should be a thing he should be able to do. I want the node foundation or the OpenJS Foundation as it is now, to be able to, to run an instance themselves that has the heart of JavaScript in it so that they're safe, they've got control of their destiny, the thing that's important for them to run and important to every Node user is something they can run themselves. Yeah, I just, I just wanted people to have, to be able to run a registry themselves. And I thought, I thought it's an ambitious, ambitious goal. <laughs> Writing a syncing algorithm that works has been really fun. Chris's brain has been melting out of his ears, but I think we have it. Well, let me just give you props yeah. on, on bringing <laughs> mm -hmm. a solution, you know, bringing code to the table and saying, here it is, world. Like, Here's all the problems, but we're working on it. We're going to solve it. It was, a, it was a mission statement for me. It was like, here's why I'm here. Here's why this matters. Okay, I'm not just complaining. Here's what I'm doing. This episode is brought to you by GoCD. With native integrations for Kubernetes and a Helm chart to quickly get started, GoCD is an easy choice for cloud native teams. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale build infrastructure on the fly for you. GoCD installs as a Kubernetes native application, which allows for ease of operations, easily upgrade and maintain GoCD using Helm, scale your build infrastructure elastically with a new elastic agent that uses Kubernetes conventions to dynamically scale GoCD agents. GoCD also has first class integration with Docker registries, easily compose, track, and visualize deployments on Kubernetes. Learn more and get started at gocd.org slash Kubernetes. Again, gocd.org slash Kubernetes. So your announcement talk was late May, early June-ish, 2019. And you brought code, but you said, don't use it. It's not ready yet. Uh, props on bringing a solution to the table. It's very much in development. How, how long had you been working on it by then? And, and when did this idea begin and the code start to go? So this will shock you. We, Chris and I had been working on it for about four weeks at that point. We didn't write a single line of code until the day he after he, his last day at NPM. He, t he kind of pinged me and said, we should talk about stuff. And I'm like, I'm not going to say a darn word to you until you're out. And I had a design document for an approach at this. And 
The Saturday after his last day at NPM, I sent him the design document, and he sent it back to me with like only exactly one sentence still the same in it. He rewrote <laughs> just, it for you? Yeah, he re- rewrote the whole thing for me. I believe the sentence was, and we'll still use Semver, but probably standard Semver instead of NPM Semver. Um, <laughs> It's like that's the only sentence that stay the same. <laughs> is it worth uh, di- uh, diving into the difference between NPM versus standard server? I didn't know there was a... The twiddle and the hat, I uh, believe, are uh, extra features. Yeah. And gotcha. Rust Rust interprets them differently. It's it's always like a, the things that are always the worst are standards that are almost, but not quite. Almost standards, yeah. Mm. So he rewrote it. Yeah, and he, re- yeah he rewrote he left it. He Semver in there. Yeah. And then I came back to him a couple days later and said... Okay, how about this? But plot twist, we federate it. And he says, okay, what does that mean? And I said, okay, let's walk through the implications of that. So we started walking through what happens when um, when these things aren't centralized, like when they're exchanging data back and forth. And at this point, like we actually we had missed working with each other quite a bit. So we like started this frenetic four weeks of hacking together and where we like wrote an awful lot of code that we threw away, but it was just like getting back into the groove of writing code again, especially back into the groove of writing code together again. I, there've been people like this in my career. I've enjoyed writing code with. It's always such a pleasure. (laughs) I enjoy writing code with Chris. We have radically different styles. Chris hates semicolons. I I like semicolons. (laughs) That seems like a non-starter right there. I mean, how can you actually work together? It's really funny. We we ended up with a code style format for Entropic that where we it, we we're essentially trolling each other with it. Like passive aggressive semicolon. It, usage. Passive aggressive semicolon usage for I me, like and then he then he torments me by standardizing <laughs> on two spaces to indent. Well, I'm glad that you guys are sweating the important things. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was, the the interesting insight that we both have is that these actually aren't important things, and they're so unimportant that both of us are willing to compromise on it. So we had four four weeks of like just we wrote a version we wrote a working registry in four weeks. It wasn't the API we wanted to have, but you could you could install through it and it would store uh, packages and and it would you know then install from that locally. And then we said, okay, that was really easy. Almost too easy. Probably, you know, it's like lots of features missing. And it would probably fall over in a stiff breeze. But like, all right, that was that was a good warm up. Now let's talk about federation. Let's talk about what you have to do in order to have more than one of these and they're synchronizing. And let's talk about what the API really should be. This was this was the fun part. It was like like getting back into straight up engineering and design together for the first time in a while. So the current the npm's data model like is is based on this tarball, right? You take a package, take a bunch of JavaScript code that's sitting in this directory, and you just, you have these rules for designing what goes into the tarball, and then you put it in a tarball, and then you ship the tarball around. The tarball is the unit of communication. There's metadata on top of that, right? There's like the package JSON, which is a big vague document. It's like package metadata and metadata for each package version. And these are the fundamental building blocks of the existing NPM API. And we said, all right, what if we write our own CLI for this? What would the API be? And what does this actually let us do with the data model? And these are the important things to get right, I think, because implementations their implementations are kind of less important than getting mm-hmm. these building blocks solid. If we have modeled the data of what should be in a JavaScript package correctly, and if we have documented an API that's good enough, then... Our implementation of Entropic shouldn't matter. You should be able to go and write your own. Mm-hmm. So that's like where all the work is right now is like <laughs> taking what we wrote and throwing it away with something that's like the right thing for the future. Okay, so the tarball. Why is why is the tarball not good? I can Question. tell you why. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not, you're asking me, but I'm sitting here thinking tarballs are cool. You know? Yeah. It's just- <laughs> <laughs> Pass them around, unzip them. Yeah, untar them. Unzip them. But the thing is, is that all right. You have a package, JS party package. You have a bug fix. You make a change to this package. You publish it again. You may have that bug fix may touch one file. Like you've you've got a three line change in this one file. So you make a tarball. It's got all the same stuff in it as all the previous tarballs, except for this one bug fix. And then that's the unit of data that gets shipped around. Uh, this is 
this is like you know inefficient, obviously, because most of that data is exactly the same. The API doesn't let you talk about it as anything yeah. other than a tarball. This is like the core idea behind Kat Marchand's Tink project, which is like, what if we talk about it in terms of files instead? This is still like not at like you know R sync level where you're talking about blocks and files, but it pushes things in the R sync direction where the unit of exchange is much smaller. Files are pretty good. Files are probably good enough for this. The complexity versus time and space trade-off, as usual. Like, rsync is pretty awesome, but do you really want R to have rsync be your package management stuff? Maybe. Chunking it up at the unit of files lets you also do things like the secret of Tink and of Entropic, which is content addressable storage, where you store files, but you only ever store any file once. Just do a SHA-256 hash of its contents, and then that's the address. Mm-hmm. So you can get that same thing out by reference. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So package becomes a, a version of a package, just becomes a list of hashes. Mm -hmm. This is where the content comes from. This is where you put it on disk. If you have those files already, you don't have to transfer them. Maybe so when installing your patched version of JS Party, the only thing you have to grab is that new one file. Because your new package is just a list of those hashes and only one yep. of them's changed. Yep. That's cool. And this really, this, this again, like going back to the data model, going super nerdy insider baseball here on the details of the NPM data model. But this is like, you can hear how excited I am about this. This is the fun part for me. Packages, if you ever, you ever just like type NPM info in a package, or if you get a package JSON, you curl it from the NPM registry. It can be really huge. It can be megabytes large. Because it's effectively unbounded, right? You've got the package, the top-level package information, what its name is, what its description is, all that stuff. And then you have per-version data. And a per-version data, because like, it just grows, unbounded, because it's you can have infinity versions for a package. Yeah. <laughs> I used to hate it, too. There would be, uh, there were some NPM packages that had over 5,000 versions on them. Eventually, these users would split off into a new package just because it became so unwieldy to download mm -hmm. a package. This speaks to the same anxiety I expressed back when we were talking about blockchains, Adam. It's yeah. like, all mm -hmm. you do is add to the... T like, you just add, add, add. Add, 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 add. It's an append-only yeah. log. I hate that. There's no there's no trimming. There's no truncation. Like, come on. Yeah, come on, people. Yeah, charting anything. Yeah. yeah. So, right. unbound is bad. This is like, this makes total sense when you're designing something in 2009, you've got 10 users, right? And you've got like, oh sure. my God, I've got 40 packages. This is epic. Some of these packages have three versions. Like you don't think ahead and you shouldn't think ahead because thinking ahead means complexity and an awful lot of work that you probably... A lot of Yagni, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Premature optimizations, all those things. What about, so just... Uh, and these weren't decisions that you were making, but you've mentioned CPAN. I'm thinking about mirrors. Like there are other projects that have come before. Yep. And now you guys have an experience of building a whole thing and, you know, scaling it. And so you and Chris have all that experience of NPM, but are you also looking around and saying like, how did RPM work? How does CPAN work? How do these other things work? Yeah. CPAN is absolutely another inspiration, right? Because it's like, it's a, it's a network of volunteer sites that together make sure that all of Pearl's packages are mirrored. I, I, in the end, if Entropic is successful, I would like that to be the solution. Like where there's like you know, a hundred yeah. of these around, hundred of these around. Maybe some companies that want them have them internally. Uh -huh. um, and, but all of JavaScript is redundant and safe across a network of these things that can cooperate with each other. Yeah, CPAN is huge inspiration. Uh, anti goals would be things that like. CocoaPods has a perfectly great solution for itself that is like relies on GitHub being there. I guess the same thing is true of uh, like the Brew package manager is like it depends yeah. on a yeah, central GitHub. GitHub, a Git thing, which is, I think, OK, given their scale. It doesn't satisfy me very, very much, though because it relies on that centralization. And it like essentially CocoaPods relies on GitHub, now Microsoft, continuing to be generous and just supporting open source, which is, to their credit, they've been great. They're doing yeah. it. But Well, let's pause and talk about that because that's kind of, I don't know if it's the ele an elephant in the room, but mm -hmm. if you talk about the problem with centralization, at least package registry diversity is better. Like two is better than one. And now GitHub is getting in the package management game. Yeah, yeah. It, well, Your thoughts well, GitHub, on that? Yeah, I, I think... 
when I, when I wear the hat of somebody who's like running an engineering team here for this, the company I'm working for, I think, Oh yeah, yeah actually it makes total sense because team management is a huge thing. Exactly. Um, yeah. and GitHub, GitHub, we're already using GitHub. This is just an incremental step. It makes perfect sense. That's aggregation theory says that everything that GitHub does here in this space will, I'll just go right in and start using it because it's easy. Right. (laughs) So Entropic, obviously a different model from, uh, from all these models, but centralization has its advantages too. So we can talk about federation problems. I mean, there's security issues, there's convenience issues, there's hosting issues. There's the problem of like, I mean, even with Mastodon, Mm-hmm. You have the opportunity for all these other instances, but like Mastodon.social is probably like eighty percent of the. I'm just making that number up, by the way. But it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge instance, right? Like it, people tend to centralize anyways because it's like the easy way. So these are things you're thinking about, right? It's discoverability is easier when everything's centralized. Yeah, you have control. Um, like Twitter can make a change to how Twitter works, and it's immediate across the whole deployed base. You know, Mastodon. Mastodon, some people have features, other people don't. Uh, There's a huge barrier to entry. NPM can yank a, a malicious repo or a malicious yep. package, excuse me. This right here. That's a huge one, right? Is super important. NPM yeah. also is a centralized place. Like every published package goes through Adam Baldwin's suspicious, beautifully suspicious hands. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that description. I'm not really sure that's a. Uh, it sounds like a compliment. It absolutely is a compliment, <laughs> Adam. I'm gonna tell him you said that. I hear you have beautifully suspicious hands. <laughs> We've had Adam yeah. on Jay's party. He's a great guy. He's he's totally a great guy. He's he's an expert, and because it's centralized, he can look at every package that comes in, and he can he can crack it open. He can look yeah. for like npm audits. A very yeah. it's a great thing, mm-hmm. right? Right. That was a big deal for the security acquisition like a year or so back, like. That was a big deal at the time, even too. We had what was that that was going on, Jared, at the time? Uh, the uh, few, an exploit. Yeah, it was either yeah. an exploit or the, well, the case where uh, event stream? I think it might have been left pad potentially. No, event stream probably. Yeah, event st- event stream was later. Yes, there was an ES lint uh, vulnerability. Like uh, rather, somebody's account got compromised during that time, mm. and there was there was also during that year a whole string of incidents mm-hmm. of coin hive being just embedded in things. Oh, yeah. CoinHive, it got to the point where like any package that mentioned CoinHive or depended on CoinHive, I'd look at it suspiciously like, mm, are you on the level? <laughs> so you know you know all these instances way better than we do because you you were dealing with them directly. How does, um, when you look at Entropic and being federated as it relates to security, what is your, how do you approach security in, in the Entropic world? Okay, so what kind of security is the first question. Let's talk about kinds of security. There's like tampering with contents. Like, are you getting what somebody intended to publish? There's yeah. there's that question. Kind of like a re- reproducible build kind of scenario? Yeah, or, or just like, did someone tamper? Like, John David Dalton uh, publishes Lodash. Are you getting what John David Dalton intended to publish? Right. Was it John David Dalton who was doing that particular publication of Lodash? These are security questions that you absolutely have to answer. Who's doing it? Are these the same bits they published? Have they been tampered with? And then you have another set of security questions, which are like, are these bits intended to be good? There's a difference between like the accidental bug where like, oops, mm-hmm. Lodash has a prototype pollution bug in it somewhere. Okay, that's a security issue. It's not a, an intentional security issue, but it's nonetheless a, a bug that has to get fixed. Vulnerability, right, yeah. In the software itself, though, not in the registry, right? Like yeah. It's a, yeah. A bad version goes in because that person wrote a bug. That's right. And, and that's like unintentional and will forever be with us. Yes. And then there's like the malicious vulnerability with like EventStream where a, a, a maintainer with bad intent gets control of a package through completely legit means – um, and then publishes bits with a bad intention. Mm-hmm. Right. And those those bits were legitimate too because that person had gotten the access in legitimate ways, was not hacking, so to speak. They may have used social constructs to hack. Yeah. But social they, yeah. they had uh, authorized access to publish to NPM. So it wasn't like they were even committing fraud, so to speak, even. That's right. And that that is like – That's, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's yeah. super hard to defend against. You might be able to detect it after the fact by 
by other be like looking at the bits that were published and saying, oh, these point to nobody should ever be publishing to a paste bin. But th- th- those are the things that, like the advantage of the centralization, the advantage of VC it's funding. It's a reaction time to that. Yeah, you know? it's a reaction time because you can afford to pay Adam Baldwin and a team to be looking at these things all the time. Mm-hmm. But there are other there are other fundamental um, security questions that I I felt while I was at NPM that NPM didn't have good answers for it, and it was difficult to make progress on them because of resources. Uh, things like package signing, everyone wants package signing, um, and it's actually tricky. What is package signing? What are you signing? What are you signing it? What are you defending against when you sign a package? These are the questions, by the way, that I'm working on right now with Entropic because I have, because the data model is different. We have a package, top level package metadata, and then an immutable version metadata object that is separate. We have a thing that we could consider signing. That, that manifest, that content addressable manifest of mm-hmm. files, is a thing we, can, we could ha- reasonably have an author sign. And what's more, if you, if you use existing signing Networks like if you use with Keybase, which is essentially usable PGP, you also have an identity trail, which is really interesting. I can figure out if the John David Dalton who signed this package is the same John David Dalton who's using this GitHub account, is the same John David Dalton who's on this Twitter account. Mm-hmm. I still don't know if it's the same person I meet in real life, unless they like tell me that. But it's right. like like <laughs> I have an yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have an I, I you have a web of identity trust, right? Yeah. That might help with that Dominic Tar problem a little bit. You'd be like, yeah. who who is this person? They don't really they don't have a presence. Are they for real? Right. The other change you have with federation versus centralization, which I guess we could argue on either side which one's more secure, but you have with centralization a singular in both GitHub and NPM's case, you know, capitalistic motivated company who's motivated to secure the registry and in the case of federation maybe you have a thousand instances and these people are volunteers and running it on their home machine and stuff like this i mean there obviously there might be corporations running instances probably likely that that'll be the case since there's costs but Potentially, like your, you could get your instance could get owned, and now you have an untrusted instance. Yes, exactly. This, this, by the way, is Chris's current like uh, the topic he's chewing on, and it's, it's actually connected with package signing because I, the identity of an instance it has mm-hmm. to be established, registered somewhere centrally. Like here we go, centralization rears its ugly head, but you need to know that entropic.dev, which is run by CJ today, is the same entropic. To, dev like three months from now that's run by cj you have to have a way to know that that it's the same that you can trust it that its signature on a package is valid i think right now that we're going to end up leaning on on keybase to do this Mm. because they they not only have that central registry of, of public keys they can give you a chain of history of the public keys and their sig chain concepts so you can see if Say someone loses a hard disk and has to wipe their entropic instance that like you, they can reestablish their ownership of that specific mm. thing. And that you, if you're getting bits from them, you can trust those bits. This is the thing. Let's suppose we have three of these things. I publish a Twitter bot to my instance or a, a tool that you use to make Twitter bots to my instance. It's just called TweetBot. Yeah, it's called tweet bots. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and and you use it. You make a Twitter bot. Like you want to have a copy of that on your own entropic instance so that you never have to depend on me. Like I can delete it. There will never be a left pad here because you've got a local copy. And then suppose you want to use that for your a different Twitter bot. Do you have to go back to home to me? What if I've gone away? You could right. get those bits from the middle one. How do you know that those bits are the same bits? Okay. If we have a a web of trust and signatures that we can trust and verify that you can depend on getting the same bits. This is not a solution to the problem of are those bits malicious that I think in the end still depends on expert humans looking at things. Um, you could imagine the node foundation running a, I keep calling them the node foundation. They're the open JS foundation. Uh, they were that for a long time. <laughs> the, <laughs> the open JS foundation, the home of all things, JavaScript running their go. own instance where they, um, they only have packages they've vetted. They don't, they don't mirror anything else. So you know that you can trust them. 
these are these are interesting problems and we could get them wrong this is like you want to talk yeah. about doubts about entropic this is actually hard yeah <laughs> sounds yeah. hard I was yeah. just, is keybase is that a company is that a, it's a foundation it's a, it's a company. This is like we. So had, now we, we have another single yeah, point of yeah, yeah. We 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 had just <laughs> had this discussion internally. Um, Kat, Chris, and I were talking mm. about do we do we want to trust uh, Keybase? Yeah. Mm. Not sure yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I don't want to have to write that right because I don't want to have to write that sig chain log again because it's um, security thinking is hard. Yeah. If somebody who knows what they're doing has already written it. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to have to reinvent that. Yeah, but package management is hard, and if somebody's already done it, then I won't have to reinvent it, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like this walk, this this delicate dance of like enough centralization to be helpful, not too much. Enough federation that we will never be in a situation like we're in now, where we are depending on a VC finance company that could go away. This episode is brought to you by cross-browser testing of SmartBear, the innovator behind the tools that make it easier for you to create better software faster. If you're building a website and don't know how it's going to render across different browsers or even mobile devices, you'll want to give this tool a shot. It's the only all-in-one testing platform that lets you run automated, visual, and manual UI tests across thousands of real desktop and mobile browsers. Make sure every experience is perfect for everyone who uses your site and it's easy and completely free to try check it out at crossbrowsertesting.com slash changelog again crossbrowsertesting.com slash changelog so we've talked about doubts We've got our doubts, obviously, but Siege, I'm sure the chores are better positioned than ours <laughs> simply because we're outsiders. What, what are your doubts with Entropic? What, where do you see the, where are the holes in the cheese, so to speak? Well, we've set ourselves a pretty chewy technical problem. Um, the, the problems of writing a package registry from scratch are difficult enough, right? Like this is, this is a very large ecosystem we have to support. And yeah. the way we've chosen to approach the problem is inherently more difficult than a centralized solution would be. We've talked about the security questions, what it is, how identity works when it's diffused across multiple instances, uh, package signing, uh, can you trust the bits you have? All of these things are more technically challenging than writing a very straightforward single source API would be. So we've kind of set ourselves a hard problem. The other interesting thing that we're discovering is that it's even harder because it's not our day jobs anymore. Chris and I both have demanding tech jobs that want our brains mm-hmm. and attention during the day and you know cat mm-hmm. cat's moving on to do package management for microsoft that like whoa this is not something we um have the luxury of well we we're spending our free time on yeah it. so the question is like okay can we devote enough time to move it forward right you got limited time yeah are people going to be okay with the pace at which it's happening um can we do this without burning out like Open source burnout is a real problem. You know, I'm sure people have talked about this with you before. Like mm-hmm. you're, you're not getting paid for this work. You are doing it as a labor of love. You're doing it because it's fun. And suddenly you've got a thousand users and they want bug fixes. And they're all entitled. Or they're mad at you because you ruined their day with that bug. But that's not how you make a living. And you've got mm-hmm. a life to go back to. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how we want to work and how we want to make decisions and the pace at which we want to work. And like it's to be seen whether we can actually pull that part off. And you know, I think I think we're up to the technical challenges of the design. Um, Chris and Kat are two very smart people. I'm very privileged to be, you know, trailing along after them watching what they do. So I think they'll solve the technical problems. Will they fail to burn out? Can I prevent them from burning out? Chris has some very thoughtful insights on this. We were talking about GitHub. GitHub is a really great place to discuss code. It's a really great place to chew on a PR. I think it's actually a very bad place to run a project. Now, this is sort of a weird thing to say, right? Because so much mm-hmm. of open source is homed on, on GitHub. But mm-hmm. I think I think the, the, the incentives are all 
kind of weird because they're about discussing code and PRs and the pressure to get at code and PRs and to bring those numbers down. Like it's gamified, get your issue count to zero, get your PR count to zero. Right. Um, but that's that's like discussing work once it's already done. It's not how you discuss work that you intend to do. It's not yeah, the future. Yeah, it's not like a good place to discuss. It's tactical a, versus strategy. Kind yes, of. exactly. Yeah. Your design, like like the the part where we talk about like okay, entropic instances have to identify themselves to each other. We have to be able to trace you know an identity through time as uh, to make sure that this entropic de- dev is the same entropic dev as last week. That's a conversation. That's a conversation among human beings. We have to talk to make sure we understand the problem and have agreed like, okay, this is a good problem statement. And then we have to go off and think, and come back and talk about a proposed solution. And then sometime later, you end up at GitHub where you like are discussing a specific implementation of that proposed solution. So how do we set up a project where that happens in a really constructive way? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Tell us. Tell well, us. Tell us. <laughs> well, this is this is experimental right now. We we okay. we we set up a discourse so we could have a forum and talk to each other. And I was oh, this was actually hard. Uh, Chris and I didn't switch over to it. And then we were asking ourselves, why are we not doing it? Oh, because we're in this little teeny Slack with each other, and we're just right. talking to each other on Slack instead of going over to the discourse. Okay, guess what? We gotta we gotta not do that. It's chat, and that was actually what we we're looking for. It's sort of a problem in that Slack is better, but Slack is not very good if you want to have an open source project because we want people to just drop in. What we want is modern IRC. Yeah, you know. So this is like me walking through this, like recapitulating the history of open source projects in the past. Why do they all have IRCs? IRCs is terrible. Oh, I get it now. Oh, okay. All right. IRC is still terrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> it is terrible. But but I get like we now have an open chat. We have a we have a Discord that we invite people to come in if they want to chat with us. Cat is most active right now on it. She's got a month off between jobs, so she's there all the time. We're trying to do our conversation there. We also try to kind of codify the way we've worked together for years now, which is we don't actually do anything out of the blue. We bounce ideas around first before we do anything. We never lead with code. We lead with, what if this? What if, here's, a, here's three paragraphs of what I think we might try to do and why. We lead with writing and talking. Mm. And then it progresses finally to code. Code is like the last step, often the easiest step, once you've like worked out what you want to do. So tie that back into how that's going to prevent the burnout because you're going to have more contributors because you're going to talk more. Well, we're going to we just we have deliberately set up a pace for ourselves where we like no decisions are going to be made on weekends. This is a rule we have. We do not make decisions on weekends. Why? Why that? Because that actually leads gives you the space to have a weekend on your own. You don't have to sit there on the project watching everything going on out of fear that someone's going to make a decision you don't agree with or or yeah. have to prevent for whatever reason. Mm. You could go away. You can have a weekend. And then, you know, on the, the regular team meeting on a Tuesday, then that's where decisions will be made. So you have space where it's okay to be away from the project. Yeah, the, the maintainer guilt is uh, oh, yeah. is really terrible, honestly. Because, I mean, if you're productive, Siege, and I'm your cohort in a project, and you're productive over a weekend, and I'm trying to hang out with my family – and I'm trying to separate my life and have that balance that's necessary. I might feel bad because you're productive and here I am, you know, slacking with my family. Yeah. It, just by doing work, I create work for you and I create pressure for you that like, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to cope with. We have to recognize our responsibilities to our team members, mm-hmm. right? The influence that we have on, on their subconscious and psyche on what they're, what they're trying to plan for. So one doubt for me and then we'll, talk about how people can get involved with what, what sounds like a, a very interesting open source project. My doubt is on adoption. Yeah. I'm curious, like just a few quick questions. Can you reuse package JSONs? Do you have, do developers have to re release their packages for Entropic or can you suck in an NPM's registry? All that. You can, the, the, our, uh, we're using Toml as our package metadata description thing. So you can have a package JSON, a Toml file coexisting in the project. You would have to publish twice. Okay. 
you can re we reuse legacy packages quite easily. You just install the legacy package, say package name at legacy, and it boop, it gets mirrored to your local Entropic. This part's working. Um, yeah, nice. something that's working. Something's working. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then you, and then you have it. You can install from it locally using the new API once it's mirrored once. Um, okay. And then, you know, keep that up to date. We're, we're still discussing, like, how often should we go and re-mirror? Should we only ever lazily mirror all these fun things? Yeah. yeah. So we should be able to coexist. Adoption is really interesting. Wow, I don't know. This is like one of those, like, well, it could fall flat on its face here. Right. Uh, I think if we get it right and if it's good enough if it solves people's problems well enough and if like that network and speed savings we think we can offer is good enough i think that will happen over time um i'm playing a long game here i don't need it to be successful in six months i need it to be successful in three years i need it to be here when npm finds it can't exist viably anymore i i need it needs to be here when whatever landing place it ends up with like decides it doesn't want to run this very expensive thing anymore so i'm thinking long term i'm patient what do you think the adoption strategy plays out so it's one thing to be patient and one thing to have sort of a long-term view you still have to have an adoption process plan you know what, what are you thinking i'm thinking i work very carefully with the node project i think i am there to, i should I need to be there to talk, satisfy their needs and to make sure that they're, I'm scratching their itch and that they understand, like, this is the eventual home for this code. I think if the Node project finds a use for this, it'll be okay. So they matter to me more than anything else. I, I'm only in this because I actually really love Node and I really love writing Node code. Mm-hmm. Um, like, why did I get involved in the PMP in the first place? Because... Node was having a hard time because NPM was down and I was having a hard time with my you know team at the time. We were trying to write Node and we couldn't because NPM was down. So I'm like, I'm here to make Node win. Absolutely, sincerely. So I want to satisfy their needs. And if I think we I think if we do that, the adoption follows. But again, like this, this, the, who knows? Um, <laughs> well, it yeah. sounds like if, if listeners, if you are interested in a, a fascinating project with lots of technical hurdles, uh, lots of problems, and no doubt an interesting ride, you can get in at the ground floor of Entropic. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's not even taking off yet. It's still just heating up the engines. So, Siege, tell everybody where's the best place to go. You mentioned the Discord. What, what are you expecting listeners to do? I know you have some uh, talks coming up. Yeah, I it it looks like either I or Chris Dickinson and I together will be at NodeConf EU in Ireland this November um, to talk. We will probably do a deep dive into what's going on technically with the API and the data model, and that'll be a lot of fun. May even have some answers on the security side for that by that point. So that'll be a fun. Go to Ireland and be at a beautiful resort in Ireland and talk Node, or you can come join us in our discourse. And our Discord, all of the disses. You can find all of these things if you go to our GitHub, which is github.com and tropic hyphen dev. And there's only one project in there. Well, actually, there are two projects in there now. Cat mm. is making projects. Find us there, and we have pointers there to our discourse and our Discord, as well as the code. Code is the least important thing right now. Come join with us and talk with us because we're in the talking phase. Any plans to have entropic.dev redirect instead of showing this design of <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's actually a, a that's that's a joke by the way. It's like what you okay. when, if you go to registry.npmjs.org you get a bunch of json. Uh, gotcha. but we need a website. We don't have a website right now. We we understand that there are a lot of people out there who are much better writing at writing websites than we are. Maybe you want to do that for us. Sweet. So there's lots of roles to fill. Many, you know, a long-term plan intended for the betterment of the node in your case, and then JavaScript at large community, the commons of JavaScript, as, you, as you've said before. You know, it's super interesting that that uh, your path with npm, and then obviously your love for Node and JavaScript, and still being willing to put in the sweat, hours, tears, pain, play, whatever it might be, but not on the weekend into. Yeah. Into this. Yeah, I, that's, that's awesome. I, I work on the weekends. Don't talk, Chris. I just don't make decisions on the weekends. Gotcha. That's right. <laughs> and you don't tell anybody you're talking about, you know, whatever. You're not alerting anybody that you're yeah. working potentially. Right. Yeah. But uh, hey, Siege, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this with us. I mean, we're 
super fans, we can't wait to have you back on uh, oh, in yeah. six months or a year's time to, to catch up on Entropic. And That'll be fascinating. So, yeah, cool. But uh, listeners out there, if you want to get involved, we'll have links in the show notes, so make sure you follow those. Uh, also, follow Siege, SiegeBot on Twitter and others, so you can kind of keep up and pay attention. Mm-hmm. Siege, thank you. You're welcome. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Changelog. Hey, guess what? We have discussions on every single episode now. So head to changelog.com to discuss this episode. And if you want to help us grow this show, reach more listeners, and influence more developers, do us a favor and give us a rating or review in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. If you use Overcast, give us a star. If you tweet, tweet a link. If you make lists of your favorite podcasts, include us in it. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Partner, Rollbar, our monitoring service, and Linode, our cloud server of choice. This episode is hosted by myself, Adam Stukoviak, and Jared Santo, and our music is done by Breakmaster Cylinder. If you want to hear more episodes like this, subscribe to our master feed at changelog.com slash master, or go into your podcast app and search for Changelog Master. You'll find it. Thank you for tuning in this week. We'll see you again soon. Hello there, listeners. How are you? This is Adam Stachowiak. If you haven't heard yet, we're launching a new show called Brain Science. It's a podcast for the curious. Are you curious? Because if so, we're exploring the inner workings of the human brain to understand things like behavior change, habit formation, mental health, and what it means to be human. It's brain science applied. Not just how does the brain work, but how do we apply what we know about the brain that can transform our lives? Learn more about the show and subscribe at changelog.com slash brain science. Until then, here's a preview of episode number two. Where we're talking about how we're all designed for relationships. I think about it like scaffolding that as our kids grow and, and it doesn't matter. Like, I just always want people to have this sense of hope and optimism around like, look, it's not over if you didn't get it in childhood or it didn't fully grow. Like neuroplasticity is one of the most amazing and hope filled things because we can continue to build this and grow all throughout our lives. And so having another person participate in the development of our own mind, it's sort of helping build neural networks that say, hey, I totally understand that you're upset as a three-nager because you did not get ice cream and you think your world is now ending. But to actually, you can still empathize, but that doesn't mean you necessarily give them that desire, Mm -hmm. right? Because I don't want them to be conditioned, i.e. I don't want them to have the perpetual feedback that when they're upset, that they just get to have the ice cream that they want. Right. Uh, Let's also say we're using children as an example here because for the audience to empathize with us, that's that's our breeding ground for research, basically. (laughs) You know, I can give an example where... My son, you know, he just some, I can't recall the exact scenario, but there was a, a moment where I was like to my wife, I said, hey, it's not that he's misbehaving because we were both sort of like in this crazy mode with him and he wasn't behaving. And I was like, you know what? It's not that he's misbehaving. It's just that he he can't right now. He's just too far gone. He's too tired. He's too exhausted. He's overstimulated. And his brain is just not developed enough to really get that we're asking him to behave right. and desiring and expecting him to, but he's just not capable. So that moment, we both sort of just curled into ourselves and just cuddled him and just was just, you know, loving to him rather than like, why can't you get this? Come on, three nager, do this. You know what I mean? Like, you know, right. so our, our breeding ground and research is our children. Right, exactly. And, you know, I, in my line of work, I mean, I will see the people where this sense of attachment and connection and feedback loop didn't go so well. And so they've learned, I always say it's sort of like they jerry rig things. <laughs> like they learned how to best function in their lives as well as they could. But we we know this whenever we jerry rig something and don't actually fix it the way it was supposed to be, what happens? Mm. It breaks down. 
Well, if you like what you hear, you should go to changelog.com slash brain science. The show is not out yet, so don't get too excited, but you can subscribe and be notified as soon as the show launches. Once again, changelog.com slash brain science.